land of ours and fill the sportsman's dreams. Enjoy what nature holds for us, her bounty never ends. Getting back to basics with the practical sportsman. It's always an adventure, no matter where we go. From a favorite hunting spot to the highest fishing hole. Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends. We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman. Hello, sportsmen. Tonight is the night. The world record whitetail buck with the hunter right here on this show. That's going to come up at the very end. Now to start this show, we're going to go fishing on Lake St. Clair on a day that's very much like January or February has been this year. Blustery. Small craft warnings looked like a bad day for fishing, but we went with Bass Pro Art Ferguson. The art of catching big bass coming up. Fred Trost Practical Sportsman is brought to you in part by MARVAC, the Michigan Association of Recreational Vehicles and Campgrounds, a nonprofit trade association representing all segments of the RV and private campground industries in Michigan. By D.L. Kessler & Sons Construction, specializing in residential and commercial construction since 1977, and by the financial support of viewers like you. Trailer hook might have got him. Boy, that's a you know that's a pretty one. I, Beautiful. All the Ooh. markings on the side there. Wow. We didn't lose Brad either. Yeah. I thought for a second he was gone. Nice way to start. <laughs> Boy, I guess. All right. So that, bait out there. that's average. So I'm now? not saying that's average, but that's what I've been averaging about the last week out here. Yeah, they've been done some good fish. Huh. Cool. Today was awesome, man. Don't you think? <laughs> yes. Why was it so awesome? What's the difference between this time and the last time? Well, about two weeks. And what's happened is the bait fish are moving in from the deeper water now. And we weren't in shallow water. We were in about 11 or 12 feet of water. But the majority of the bait fish are in shallower now. They're in four or five feet shallower than they were just two weeks ago when we tried to film out here. And. Uh, the, the bigger concentrations, the bigger fish are moving in feed. Now, if you notice, all the fish we caught were really fat. They weren't that long. I mean, you caught a five pound bass today that was 21 inches. That's not that long of a bass for five pounds, but it had the girth. They're, they're just stocking up on shad right now. In the fall like this, the bait fish move into shallower water and the big bass follow them. Now, the birds keep an eye on the bait fish too. And when they're swimming near the surface, the seagulls dive down and grab a quick meal. It's not uncommon for bass and other predator fish to be feeding on a school of bait fish from below, which drives the small fish toward the surface, and the birds pick them off from the top. You can see a bait fish flipping on the surface as we back this up. It could be a shad or a sucker or a shiner, some small fish that both the seagulls and the bass like to eat. It could be jumping on the surface to escape a big fish that was chasing it. Or maybe the fish got it because the seagull didn't. In any case, seagulls feeding on bait fish is a sign that bass could very well be feeding below. And Art Ferguson rigs us up with tube jigs that imitate shad or small fish. This is why fishermen use bird activity to help locate a good fishing spot. Oh, there it is out there. The jump? Yeah. That's got to be a pretty good fish. I don't know if it's... No? I don't think it's huge. This 25 mile an hour wind's kind of helping it along? Yeah. I don't think it's as big as the one that you had. No. I sure did dig one. Oh, that's there a nice is. fish. Oh, there Fred. it is. There's nothing wrong with it. No. Tell you what, I'm going to use a net here just to get this puppy in the boat. Yes, that is. That's about three and a half pounds. It's better than I thought. Whoa. Hold on, friend. Hang on.
come to Papa. Watch that bag there. Oh, that's a nice fish. Holy, oh, wee. holy. Oh, wee. Oh. That's a camera fish. I think we can take the <laughs> tournament with that. Oh my Look God. Look at the size of that. That's, we're gonna I, weigh I, I that. We're gonna a, weigh that. That's over four. That's the biggest smallmouth I've ever caught. I'll tell you that for Ooh. a fact. Nice fish. Wow. Had him hooked good too, he wasn't coming off. Look at that. Well, here, let me hold that baby just, yeah. just because. Whoa. Man, oh man. That's a smallmouth and a half. Holy cow. So you, you have a good scale? Bring your leg over here. Yeah. Cool. It's pretty accurate. It's gonna be hard to do in this wind. That fish should go almost four pounds. Oh wow. No, 4.8. 4.7. 4. A lot bigger than I thought it was. 4.5. It's getting smaller. Okay. So what do you take? I take the 4.8 myself, because that was the first <laughs> that was the first we'll get it again here. The first score. Now it's 4.4. I'm disappointed in that scale. I think the batteries are dying. 4.8. There we are. It's about a, about a 4.6, 4.7. That says 4.8. 4.7. Four and three quarter pound. Four and three quarter pound bass. Whew, man. That's, it, you ever happen to have a tape measure? Uh, you yeah. don't do it that yeah. way, huh? Yeah, I've got one. Look at that baby. Oh my. Huh? <laughs> That's worth coming out today. It sure is. <laughs> Let's see what the what the tape says, but it's inside out. Yeah. Not a very long fish. Do I hit 20? A little longer, almost 21 inches. 21 inches. Well, I'm proud of that now. Do you have to revive it or anything, or you just, no, I just move it back and forth two or three times. You mean like this? Yeah. She'll be fine. How do you know it's a she? Because it's big. Males don't get that big. Oh! oh yeah. There we go. Great. Oh, that's cool. The weather forecast at 7 in the morning was for heavy winds from the south, and as the clock ticked on, the winds picked up. We had to tighten the bands on our hats so they wouldn't blow off. The wind got so strong by 10 o'clock that I had to use the lock-on position to anchor it in place. Lock on. <laughs> We were drifting over some good fishing spots, but the wind was blowing the boat so fast that Art put a sea anchor out in the water. That's a big bag that's attached to a rope. It catches the water like a parachute catches wind and slows the boat down. Oh my gosh. I might have a five pounder here. Oh, you think? Close. I'll get him. Get that. Get that. Lift her Yeah, I got to put Oh, 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 that's a big one. That's a big one. <laughs> this is almost not funny. What's well, not funny? It's the best day I've had out here this year for big fish, Fred. And you right? just happen to be with me. <laughs> I hate to keep waiting. No, I, I, don't, I, don't just, I just don't happen to be with you. I'm probably the reason for having this good day. That's not going to be five. That's Without a seat to lean against, it was more comfortable for me to sit on the floor, or at least until I got a fish on. We only saw two or three other boats on Lake St. Clair, and this was a relatively warm Sunday morning late in September. There weren't many boats out because the conditions were so uncomfortable for the fishermen. The wind certainly wasn't bothering the fish, though. In fact, it may have made the fishing better. Dandy. Here you oh, go. there he is. Man, I wonder if people could actually comp 
comprehend how much wind we're in right now. I don't know. It's, it's, it's got to be 25 to 30 mile an hour wind. Oh, yeah, look at that. Ooh. Big one. Ooh. Did you hear it? <laughs> Spanking the surface. I haven't even woke up yet. You're doing this to me. <laughs> oh. This, I think, is better than any of them. Really? I think. I mean, it feels like it's big. I should probably get the net. Get the net, please. The net would be a good thing. Oh, wow. Huh? Yeah, that's another four plus. Wee! <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that! Oh, <laughs> oh man! Oh, look at how you added this one hook. Look at that. Barely hooked. Barely hooked. Barely hooked. Barely hooked. Boy, look at that. Hey, we got, we've got the scale out still. Okay. I can't even stand up myself. That's five. Holy cow, that's a five-pounder! Five-pounder! <laughs> Woo-hoo-hoo! Well, let's, let's get the tape on it. I gotta have the tape on it. Let me uh, get a picture of my camera. Yeah, because this is, this is incredible! A five-pound smallmouth. This will probably be, what do you think? 20... Trophy fish are measured two ways, by weight and by length. We use length on our practical sportsman fishing boards, and you squeeze the tail together when you measure a fish's length. A 20-inch smallmouth is an award winner. About 21, anyway. 21. 21. Fat as can be. They're just in oh, here. Yeah. The whole deal is we started looking for the shad, the shad school yeah. of shad out here. The birds were diving on some shad, and we pulled in here, and that's what we're catching. Look at this. Smallmouth bass. Five pounder, a 4.7 and a 4.5. Along with some three pounders. <laughs> <laughs> what a day! What a day! In reality, most people wouldn't be out here fishing in this. I mean, this <laughs> most people, few people are. But hey, hey. Being a tournament Jack bass Nichols pro, Art releases all of his catch to catch another day and maybe win a tournament. I don't mind doing that at all, but it is nice to measure the big ones and at least get some photos. Just working back and forth. Yeah, but give me, don't let it go. Well, I'm not gonna let it go. We're gonna get another picture of it. There you go. You ready? Come over here. Trading places is always interesting to do in a canoe, even when it's calm. In a bass boat with 30 mile an hour winds, it's also an interesting challenge. But this is part of the fun of bass fishing, being out in adverse conditions, letting mother nature pound and pummel, but catching bass anyway. Let's review what we caught on this day with small craft warnings. Art started with a good three pounder. I got the next one, which was four and three quarter pounds. That was the biggest smallmouth I had ever caught and tossed back. Art got bass number three, which weighed just a little over four and a half pounds. I countered with smallmouth number four. It was three, three and a half pounds. I also got number five, the smallest three pounder of the day that jumped into the net. Art pulled in bass number six, which went about four and a quarter. And even though I took the big one of the day, a five pounder, 21 incher, there's no doubt in my mind that the art of catching big bass is Art Ferguson. Who else could find big bass on a day like this? I pointed out last week that the Canadian spring bear season was being canceled for the reason that the Ministry of Natural Resources said that cub bears are being orphaned when sow bears with cubs are shot during the spring hunt. Now it's against the law in Canada to shoot a sow bear with cubs, so any females with cubs that are taken in the spring hunt are being taken illegally. Nonetheless, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources has seen fit to close the spring bear season based on this rationale. Now, three-fourths of the people who hunt bear in Ontario are Americans. Many come from Michigan. The bear hunters are not happy that the spring season will be closed because they'll lose the opportunity to hunt. And the outfitters, guides, restaurant and resort owners in northern Ontario aren't happy either because they're going to lose an estimated $8.8 .8 million in revenue this spring. Now, I just got a fax from Safari Club International, which says 
This issue is strictly an anti-hunting decision brought on by organized pressure from Ontario's, especially Toronto's, very active animal rights lobby. Well, Safari Club is asking Michigan hunters to bombard the Canadian government with letters. Now, other hunting groups are threatening a boycott of hunting and fishing trips to Ontario. An Ontario law gives citizens 30 days to register objections, and the SCI news release says, if enough objections are received, the government must hold further discussions before the proposal becomes law. Now, keep in mind that further discussion doesn't mean anything's going to change necessarily. Just like our DNR, the Ontario Ministry is free to do what it sees fist. Then the SCI news release said, Canadian officials have informed us that letters of objection from United States residents will have the same impact as those from Canadians. Every individual can have a tremendous impact on this decision. Now, I'm not trying to undermine SCI's efforts, but I question how well the people of Canada welcome the protests of Americans who don't live or pay taxes in Ontario. Now, if $8.8 million from hunters doesn't make a difference, why would our letters make any difference? Well, to find out, I called and faxed this question, along with what I just told you, uh, to several offices in Ontario, including the Ministry of Natural Resources. So, what was the response? Well, I didn't get one right away. In fact, I didn't get a response in time for this telecast. But next week, I will have an answer to this question from a Canadian official as to which has more impact, the hunter's money that Ontario loses or the letters we hunters write? Or is closing the spring bear season a done deal any way you look at it? Well, let's look now at a couple of issues in the news in Michigan. At the end of December, the Associated Press reported in the Lansing State Journal that salmon stocking in 1999 will be reduced by about 25% in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Now, the DNR says they're concerned about two things, a resurgence of bacterial kidney disease in salmon and what they believe is a shortage of alewives in the lakes for the salmon to eat. Well, what will the effect be? Well, less salmon to catch. Now, the Detroit News headline says that Michigan will suffer from the reduction of Chinook plants. Now, don't bother writing letters to our government about this or organizing a boycott. It doesn't matter. Just like Ontario's decision on their bear season, our DNR has decided that despite the protest of anglers or any negative impacts on the economy, this cut will be made. Now, here's another recent decision by our DNR reported in the Lansing State Journal three weeks ago. A cartoon character will deliver the DNR's message to children. Now, this cartoon character is Buck Wilder, a character featured in several books for kids. The DNR is spending nearly a million dollars for the rights to use this cartoon character. According to DNR Director K.L. Cool, quote, this is probably the most exciting thing that we're working on. That was a direct quote from our DNR director who said the cartoon character is probably the most exciting thing we're working on. Whoa. Cool says there is declining interest and participation in outdoors recreation, which results in declining support for natural resources management, especially in hunting and fishing. The outdoor industry is declining. It's not in good shape. Oh, let's just thank our lucky stars that our DNR has the foresight to spend millions of dollars on a cartoon character that will save us. Well, you can read about these issues on our website and register your opinion. So what can you tell about campers from their campsite? Well, you can tell here, look at the bicycles here. One, two, three, four, five bicycles. This probably has kids. Those are small bicycles. Let's see what else can we tell. They got some, can you see that there, Maddie? They got, they got corn. They're ready for a corn roast tonight. Now, here's where they're probably going to be doing the corn roast. I have never used one of these little tripods. You ever used one, Matt? Nope. I don't know what this is all about. We're going to have to get into this, though, because I see quite a few of them around the campsite. Also, they have a charcoal hibachi type of thing here. Yep, they'll be cooking on this, too, I'm sure. And uh, as I said, what can you tell about campers? You can tell that they are red-blooded American 
perfect sportsman. Perfect sportsman because look at this. You can't get any more perfect than this. Go Red Wings, yes. Right here at the campground, Michigami Shores in the Upper Peninsula in the middle of July, proudly displaying our Red Wing flag. Salute. If we have a three-peat this year, I definitely will get a new flag. Uh, but this served me well last year anyway. Now for our guide report, let's check out, well, we're talking about areas that are real in transition, like it's March or April almost. Down here in the Detroit River, open water fishing. Perch and pike are good, gross eel and bluegill in the canals. Remember, that's open water fishing, bobbers and the whole works. Lake St. Clair, Metro Beach, this is uh, at the boat basin. This is through the ice, but it's been hit and miss for perch, some fair pike and walleye fishing. Saginaw Bay, up here we're talking perch. It, they said it was good Sunday, poor on Monday, according to Ernie at Frank's Great Outdoors. Uh, in the river here, Saginaw River, we're talking uh, ice flows coming down the river, so this is boat fishing. Oscoda, good numbers of perch, Van Etten Lake, but they are small steelhead fare in the Osable River. Uh, Long Lake has still been producing in the Alpena Rockport area. There is, seems to be plenty of ice up here, pike and whitefish. Indian River reports Cisco and perch good in Mullet Lake, and walleye and brown trout are fair in Burt. Here at Birch Tree, Drummond Island, they're getting pike on tip-ups, plenty of ice up here, and some big pike at that. Over here, Tom's Hunt and Fish in Marquette. Sean says that there's some good pike fishing on tip-ups. In the Keweenaw, look at this interesting array of fish. Smelt Limits, Keweenaw Bay, they're real tasty at this time of year, too. Herring, one to two per angler. Coho, been great, they say. Lake Superior, nice, small, good ones for the grill. Ontonagon, perch and whitefish limits, and lake trout they've been getting, right, in Lake Superior. This is ice fishing. Gladstone, Pike, uh, pike and perch have been fair, according to Ed at Bayshore, and walleye are good, many up to nine pounds. But, but you got to start watching the ice at this time of year. Pilgrim's Village. Sue says they've been getting some limits. The perch, crappie, bluegill, steelhead are just starting at Tippy Dam. Smelt good in Green Lake. Ludington, steelhead limits. Paramarquette Lake, that's through the ice. Smelt, Crystal Lake, uh, 8 to 10 inches. Great tasting at this time of year. Uh, Whitehall, perch, walleye. Pike bluegills are good, but call ahead for current ice conditions. The reason is, take a look at the ice. Uh, Whitehall is right there in that transition zone where it's, where it's iffy. There's plenty of ice in the northern part of the state as far as snow goes. Well, uh, no snow in the southern part of the lower peninsula, a little bit in the northern lower in the UP. Well, that's the place you have to go for the snow sports. Where I'll be for the next week and a half is at camper shows almost every night and during most of the days. Tomorrow and Saturday, I'll be in Flint at the IMA. Sunday, the Flint show will continue, but I'll be moving to the Novi Expo Center for the Detroit RV and Camping Show, which opens noon on Sunday and every weekday at noon. I'll be there in the evenings, but either Tara or Joanne or Vera from the Arvoom staff will be there during show hours. Saturday night, February 20th, is our hunting awards banquet for bucks and turkeys taken with shotguns, followed the next two weeks by hunting and fishing awards banquets at the Eagles Hall in Lansing. And on Friday the 26th, I'll be at a camper show in Hastings. I'll tell you about that next week. It involves free food, and that's where we'll be in the weeks ahead. Next week, our telecast will be from the Detroit RV and Camper Show in Novi. That's where I'll be most of the week, at least during the evenings early in the week, and for the entire show hours from Thursday on. Now stop by, say hi. We can talk about becoming more independent outdoors by using an RV. See you next week. To get in touch with us or to get information about the TV show or where we'll be or learn about RVOOM, the new Recreational Vehicle Owners Organization of Michigan, check out our website at www.outdoorconnections.net. You'll find our email address, our street address, our P.O. box, our phone number, our fax number. This website is a good way to get connected to all kinds of outdoor information. And we'll send you a free copy of our RV Camping and Outdoor Digest magazine. We just need to hear from you. Fred Trost Practical Sportsman is brought to you in part by MARVAC, the Michigan Association of Recreational Vehicles and Campgrounds, a nonprofit trade association representing all segments of the RV and private campground industries in Michigan. By D.L. Kessler & Sons Construction, specializing in residential and commercial construction since 1977, and by the financial support of viewers like you. 
We're gonna. We got the man here. Oh, yeah. This is it. You Fred. are the hunter with the world record buck. Well, thank you. Yeah, huh? I uh, shot him in 1983. And well, let's go over here, Milo. Milo Hansen is the man. Bigger, bigger. Bigger, yeah. Bigger. Saskatchewan. B i g g a r. Okay, and that uh, that's a bigger buck than anything in the books. Huh? Yeah, they say New York is big, but our deer are bigger. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's something. Yeah, he's. What is this score, the Boone and Crockett score? He uh, nets out at 213 and 5.8, grows at 220. And, of uh, course, this is a, a typical rack. That's a typical rack, yeah. He's really symmetrical. You know, why he scores good is because of his long tines, mm -hmm. uh, good, uh, you know, inside spread, long main beams, and really symmetrical, you know. So what was the story on getting the world record buck? Well, uh, in a nutshell. In a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want an hour, well, eh? I know that you can do an hour. I don't know about that. <laughs> But well, we knew he was in the area because our local bus driver seen him, you know, at different times. Eh? And he actually could have took pictures of him, but he wasn't a hunter. But they actually stopped once and the kids in the school bus looked at him. Oh, really? Yeah. And then uh, during the summer, different people had seen him, you know. Uh, an old neighbor of ours seen him out in his field. And then during muzzleloader season, a friend of mine uh, seen two big bucks. And when I got this one, he said, I got the small one. But <laughs> he was looking for him with the muzzleloader, you know. Uh, he actually lived uh, where his shed was found. He wasn't actually that far from the town of Bigger itself. It was sort of an old uh, yard, probably about 100 and some acres of bush there, you know, and uh, nobody bothered in there. Eh? Huh. So then when rifle season started, uh, we went looking for him, eh? and uh, there was four of us, you know, and uh, we looked for a week and two days. And, uh, the no, first any, week... Any four of you could have got it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Let's stand over here while we can see this in the back. Yeah, yeah. yeah you want the deer in there. So, did you know it was a world record? No. Uh, you had no clue? Well, I knew uh, I'd get the local trophy. I never thought world record once, you know. Wow. Uh, you know, we always, you know, hunt for for the fun of it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we just, you know, don't go hunt for trophies, I guess. But we hunt for three weeks, and we look for a big deer. And in the end, we'll shoot something to eat, because we all eat the meat. And, How was this uh, to eat? It really good, exactly. <laughs> really good, yeah. Uh, was it any uh, special thrill to eat world record yeah. deer meat? Oh, a lot of people ate it, like I gave Jim Zumbo some, and you know, these yeah. guys. Yeah, <laughs> famous outdoor writer. Yeah, yeah. So, so what was the story on the day that you got this? What, what yeah, well, see, actually, I, we hunted for a whole week, and there was no fresh snow. And uh, my friend seen him a couple times, and then we couldn't track him because he ended up into a field of unharvested crop, and the deer had been feeding all night, you know.